Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the um, Research Day. Um, um, my name is Alfonso Iorio. I'm the chair of the department. Um, I'll repeat the name for everyone's sake, Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact. Again, welcome to the Research Day. Uh, this is HEI annual cornerstone event. And uh, my warmest welcome go to our learners whom we want center and frontal for this event as always. The research day is a showcase of our research. It offers us, the HEI community, an opportunity to come together to recognize and celebrate the remarkable and impactful, impactful health research happenings across the department. And ideally, I say ideally because once more we are here in a, a remote modality, hopefully for, for the last time, ideally identify and develop future research collaboration with colleagues outside our own respective field of expertise, our own silos, if you want. Before I continue, and uh, well aware that uh, it will be much more meaningful being welcomed by Jennifer um, soon after, but before I continue, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and acknowledge that McMaster University operates, teaches, and learn on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Odenoshone nations and which the lands protected by the dish with one spoon, one poom, an agreement amongst all allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We will never say enough um, of our recognition. I will come back with thanks at the end uh, of these uh, um, two split uh, half days research day, but I'd like to put a first thank you at the beginning. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, this opportunity um, we have uh, and to thank for these, the members of the organizing committee for their commitment and tireless effort in planning and hosting this year research day. We have uh, navigated through a first ECAP that's one of those left. Many more were sorted out uh, leading to this day. The two-day agenda is uh, very ambitious. Um, we will never reach uh, our highest ambition, but we are walking in that direction. There are oral presentation, poster presentation. There are um, a plenary session led by and featuring members of our faculty, students, emeriti, and alumni communities. It's on us to make this event uh, memorable, to make it a learning opportunity, to make it a teaching opportunity. I don't think, Robbie, I need to add uh, anything more at this stage. Um, we have uh, still maybe a couple of minutes if you need to give any housekeeping um, instruction, and if not, uh, we'll pass on directly to the first plenary. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, okay, the audio is better now. I think it was me. Um, I just want to mention that as uh, all the previous years, we have three uh, abstract presentation awards to give uh, during the event, and they will be announced at the end of tomorrow. And uh, uh, one important thing to mention for that is one of the awards, the Murray Enkin Award, will be based on uh, voting results by attendees. We provided the link to the survey in the lobby. Uh, it's in the description there, the main text when you enter the lobby, as well as uh, I put a link in the chat there. So please go there, uh, have a look at the posters and, and vote for your uh, favorites for most presentations. And then we will uh, provide the results tomorrow. Um, I think that's my yet. Okay, thank you, uh, Robbie. Um, we we don't want to uh, start ahead of time uh, to allow those who are busy somewhere else to be 
uh, taking the entirety of uh, um, Jennifer presentation. Um, but in the meantime, we can uh, either have anyone willing to uh, say a welcome or a wish or get uh, set up for the first session. Um, I can't really check at the same time I'll speak if Bernice and Lisa are on the on the call already, but if they are, they are welcome to start um, uh, turning off the turning on. Sorry, their cameras. I see Jennifer did um, welcome, and as soon as they have a chance, uh, Lisa and Bernice may do the same. Do you want to try out your audio, Jennifer, in the meantime? That was a good idea then. <laughs> you have not yet uh, been able to unmute yourself. I don't know, Gabby, if you have to allow Jennifer to unmute. Sorry, everyone for, uh, okay. I think, I, think I, can, I can speak now. Can you hear me? Clear and loud. Thank okay. You. Um, <laughs> you know what? Why don't you also uh, get ready to present sure. your slides so that we... Yeah, I'm happy to. And I just want to say, I think Bernice is double booked for the for maybe the first few minutes. So um, we'll have to start without her, but she'll join us when she can. Yeah. I'll start by sharing my screen and I'll just wait until it's time. Yes. And um, I will then have the pleasure of introducing you, Jennifer. Wonderful. Great. <laughs> so. Yes, we can see your for now is in um, yeah, now is in presentation mode. Okay. Perfect. Okay, let me check one thing. Okay, I think we can uh, um, get uh, ready to start. Oh, Lisa, so uh, Gabby, Lisa is uh, texting that uh, she'd like to join, but she can't uh, unmute or, or turn on her camera. If you can, please take care of that as well. <laughs> You would think that Hi, after the can years you... of pandemic, yes, we can hear you. And uh, <laughs> thanks. Hopefully, uh, we'll I... see you soon. I can't seem to turn on the camera, although I thought I just gave it permission to start my video. Uh, <laughs> maybe we can do it without camera. <laughs> I'm yes, sorry we can about do that. Without camera, we can do anything after <laughs> two years of pandemic. So, no worries. Okay. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm trying my best to, to get on, but it's uh, it's been a, just a, a few minutes of frustration here. So, um, but at the same time, I'm also delighted to be here. So I will say thanks very much. Um, Alfonso, did you want to start now or did you want to wait the two minutes? We have uh, two more minutes. So um, I let me check the number of attendees. If it's stable or it's still there's still people trickling in. I think there's still people joining, so we may want to wait a little longer. And even if you are not on video, uh, Lisa, you'll uh, uh, you'll make the introduction. All right. Thank you. Good. Um, I keep trying to start my video. I keep getting messages, but all it tells me is my camera is not launched properly. Please check my browser. So I don't know. All right. We can do this without sight. Nobody needs to see me. Um, so, so just uh, a second, Lisa, can... Lisa, Lisa, let me stop you for just a second. Bernice connected, Gabby. 
So it would be great if you could uh, unmute uh, her as well. And uh, thank you, Bernice. We know that you were uh, triple or quadruple booked or something like that, but <laughs> you managed to escape one way or another and be with us. We really appreciate you being here uh, one minute ahead. Of, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's great. It's great to be able to join Jennifer. Thanks. Uh, and I, I did luck out, although it was a crazy morning. <laughs> Good. And I do just to let you know, I do have a few slides. So I'll just share them from my computer. And whenever, Jen, I'll jump in whenever you let me know. Good. I believe uh, we are uh, getting to the top of the hour. And I believe the best I can do is mute myself and let the three of you share the podium, um, introduce and get started. I'll be here listening. Thanks very Welcome much, everyone Alfonso. again. <laughs> Thank you, Alfonso. Welcome everyone again. That's right. Um, I'm Lisa Schwartz, invisible voice here today. Um, and I am supposed to ask you please to remember uh, to use the chat within the Zoom box. So there's two places where you can place your chats, but we'll be following the Zoom box primarily, although I'll check every once in a while for the other one. Um, uh, so please use your Zoom chat for any questions or comments um, as, as we go along. Um, the session is being recorded for future viewing, I think, within the department, so um, and, and potentially outward as well. Um, so please uh, be aware of that when you do um, chat. Um, and that we're asking all attendees right now to mute their microphones and turn off their cameras. And we've seen an example of what happens if your mics are not muted uh, because it, uh, it tends to create an echo, which is not very productive for all of us. Um, so this is our first day of, um, uh, of the HEI um, Research Day. And I'm really delighted that our keynote speakers um, are going to bring to us something brand new in the way of, of research for some of us um, and an important reflection for, for, for everyone gathered. Um, so Dr. Jennifer Walker is a Haudenosaunee member of Six Nations of the Grand River with a PhD in Community um, Health Sciences and Epidemiology from the University of Calgary. Um, for those who are not aware, we were very fortunate that Dr. Walker joined HEI a few months ago um, and is now an associate professor and is leading the research hub um, at the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge. Um, doctor's work focuses, Dr. Walker's work focuses largely on Indigenous community engaged health research using large health services databases through her work as a core scientist um, and the Indigenous health lead at ICES in Ontario, and also with the Health Data Research Network in Canada. She has an active community engaged research program in aging and dementia and is the co-lead of the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration. Um, and aging or CCNA um, and this uh, a team of researchers which uh, team 18 I guess that, that follows issues in dementia care for indigenous populations and uh, the lead for uh, for the indigenous cognitive health program. Um, Dr. Walker has also led the validation of the Canadian indigenous cognitive assessment tool and the implementation of the tool um, in Anishinaabe communities in Northern Ontario. And before I um, move on to um, give uh, Dr. Walker the floor, I'd also like to invite uh, to introduce you to Dr. Bernice Downey. Some of you may be familiar with Dr. Downey, um, who I, from the bio, and will probably do this again, describes herself as a woman of Ojibwe and Celtic heritage, a mother and a grandmother. Um, Dr. Downey is a medical anthropologist and was recently appointed the first associate dean of Indigenous Health for the Faculty of Health Sciences. Her background is in health policy, uh, previously with Health Canada, um, and she holds a Heart and Stroke Foundation CIHR research chair in Indigenous women's um, heart and brain health. So um, I, the, the 
the work of today's session, I think, is for all of us to do. Um, we are here to learn as much as we are to reflect and expand our understanding of what we mean by health research methodologies when we talk about that. It seems the most fitting thing for um, a department of, of, of our caliber and of our strengths um, to be opening our, our notions up um, more widely to how um, we can uh, approach research and health research um, and do it as in part an act of reconciliation um, to improve our work with the communities that we work with, um, but also I think to, to make a more fair and equitable approach to research in health more generally. So I'll hand the um, platform over, the mic over to um, Jennifer, and um, I'll be watching the chat for questions and comments as we go along. Thanks very much, Jennifer. I hope this works. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for thank that introduction. Um, and uh, I'm so glad Bernice is here at the beginning. She wasn't sure if she'd be able to. So um, I think that will really round out uh, the, the methodology um, presentation as well. So, so I'm just so happy to be here for this HEI Research Day, my first um, uh, as an associate professor in this uh, department. And, um, and it's a really nice, I think, way to introduce myself to many of you that um, I don't recognize. There's so many names <laughs> that I actually don't recognize. So um, I can't wait to see you in person and, and, to, uh, and to collaborate and work with you. Um, so I think that the sort of two purposes of, of what what we wanted to talk about today was really to, um, so, you know, it's not gonna be a methods presentation. We're not talking about methods, we're talking about methodologies and the approaches to thinking about indigenous, inclusion of indigenous perspectives um, and, um, and also, you know, indigenous led research and making that space for indigenous led research approaches and approaches to, you know, curriculum and education in our department. So um, to do that, and then, and Bernice um, and I have been working together to think about this um, for the Faculty of Health Sciences overall as well through the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge. And so we're also um, going to uh, give you a sense of what the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge is and, and what supports are there um, in the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge as well. So those are the kinds of things we're gonna talk about. But to, to really <coughs> ground ourselves <coughs> in ethical Indigenous research, the research here, here are some of the things that I want to start with. One is a grounding in Indigenous paradigms and knowledges so that we start from a perspective of privileging Indigenous paradigms and knowledges when we're thinking about um, ethical Indigenous research. The second is a grounding in a shared understanding of colonization, the impacts of colonization. And as Lisa mentioned, um, and I really appreciated that, Lisa, the sort of like commitment to um, research as a, as, a, as a means for reconciliation, like actually um, research with this specific intent and um, uh, and uh, of that, for that shared understanding to develop um, approaches to reconciliation as well. And also a grounding in Indigenous sovereignty and rights. I'd say the first question, because I work with large databases and I was talking about Indigenous governance of these large databases when there's Indigenous data involved, some of the um, most common questions that I receive are about why. Why do we have to uniquely do this for Indigenous populations and not for other populations? Or if we do it for Indigenous populations, does that mean we are doing this for all populations? And so just a real, um, a, a bit of a grounding in understanding Indigenous sovereignty and rights, given where we are in the world and in history. So those are some of the things we're going to, we're going to cover. So what I, you know, as an epidemiologist, work with data, and I'm a health services researcher, so work with data quite a bit. And this um, quote from Elizabeth Medicine Crow guides a lot of the thinking <laughs> around Indigenous data so, and Indigenous research. 
She says, the act of knowing is a collective, cultural, and political imperative for Indigenous peoples. Information, data, and research about our peoples, collected about us, with us, or by us, belongs to us and must be cared for by us. So I want to start with that sort of perspective, uh, that Indigenous perspective on data and research, whether it's collected about Indigenous peoples or by Indigenous peoples or with Indigenous peoples, there's this sense of responsibility that um, Indigenous um, knowledge holders, Indigenous leaders, Indigenous um, uh, you know, the governance systems, that the sense of responsibility that um, people have for the information, for the data, for the sacredness of the information. One example that I would say is, you know, at ICES, we hold this, these large, um, you know, administrative health databases. So um, probably many of you are familiar with these, but I'll just briefly say that, you know, each time someone with an Ontario health card interacts with the healthcare system, there's often a, a, you know, a record kept of that. And these records are all held in databases and then link, they're linkable together and, you know, can come together to tell a story. I was working with um, a, a collective of First Nations health services organizations across Northern Ontario who wanted to access that data for their populations. And they wanted to understand, basically, allow the data to tell the story of how those individuals in their communities are dying. They wanted a mortality study. So they wanted to look and see what could be learned by looking at the databases and allowing the data to tell a story. And really, this, the sort of um, spiritual aspect that um, those, um, that that partnership um, you know, really uh, held for those data were, was so strong um, and they really viewed each data point as um, an ability, like a way that their ancestors could teach them how to live better. So how could the data from those who have passed on be teaching us how to live today? And so this whole spiritual aspect of the data and of the research that was integrated even in just you know analyzing a secondary analysis of administrative data. So these, these approaches come back to this level of responsibility and the sacredness of the information that's held about Indigenous people by Indigenous people or with or have been collected with Indigenous people. So it doesn't matter how it's been collected. And you may have access to some of these data sets that have information about Indigenous peoples. And this is something you need to know. When we think about Indigenous paradigms, um, thinking about research, there's a couple of places I would, I would direct you to. There's so many amazing resources. Um, it's not hard to learn about Indigenous research methodologies. There are some amazing resources, and these are two that I always highlight because um, I find that they are, um, one, there's very few quantitative research, Indigenous, quantitative Indigenous research sources. And this methodology, um, Maggie Walter and Chris Anderson, um, for looking at Indigenous statistics may resonate with some of you um, who are, you know, working with um, quantitative data. Um, and then, and so the approach is really um, in both this, the Indigenous statistics, uh, quantitative research methodology, and research is ceremony. So research is ceremony. This, um, this approach really builds to this concept of relational accountability so that we must be thinking about ourselves in relation to um, communities, in relation to um, the research itself, in relation to creation, in relation, relation to past, present, and future. So this idea of relational accountability and building to um, this uh, accountability as a researcher um, is sort of the is sort of the thing that this this whole um, methodology that's um, outlined in research is ceremony builds to. 
And then I listed the, some of the concepts that build to these methodologies. Things like understanding holistic aspects of, of, of being, really, not just of health, but of being. So this idea of holism um, and, and holistic understandings of health and wellness. Um, and I can tell you that um, in many cases when, when we're, so I did, I, I was involved in a large study um, looking at aging and multimorbidity and frailty um, in Ontario First Nations. And holism came into it, um, no matter which angle we were looking at, whether we were looking at the administrative data, we were looking at survey data, we were looking at qualitative information, this idea of, of the health of a whole person, of um, the relational health, of that person, so this interconnection between individuals and how that impacts um, impacts health. It also impacts the way that we do research, um, from all the way to how we pay honoraria to how we um, hire people in communities. This idea of interconnection um, weaves through um, all of the approaches that that we have to take to research. Um, another thing that is often very challenging for um, people who are uh, trained in public health or epidemiology or, um, or these, um, these disciplines where we, we're often modeling poor outcomes um, is the idea of taking strengths-based approaches. Now, sometimes that's easier when we think about the approach itself. We can we can build on strengths and community. We can build capacity. We can build our mutual capacity. But when it comes to actually modeling um, outcomes or understanding or developing um, survey questions or understanding which outcomes as indicators we're going to track, thinking about that in a strengths-based way is often really hard for people. And that's one of the things that this Indigenous statistics. Um, uh, helps to, to guide us towards. And I'll give you an example of um, strengths-based um, approaches and methodologies. And the most wonderful example is um, through the Thunderbird Partnership, I, could, I would say. So they um, are have developed um, sort of approaches to collecting data um, around mental health and addictions. The outcomes that they are interested in measuring so the outcomes for mental health and addiction is hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. So that is an entirely different um, orientation to thinking about outcomes of mental health and addictions programming. So often when we're thinking about mental health and addictions programming, you know, if we're using, if we're using um, traditional outcomes, they are um, deficit-based outcomes. Um, but re really these ones, hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose are uh, such wonderful examples of strengths-based outcomes. The importance of stories comes um, throughout, weaves throughout all of the, um, the research work that we do. And very important, this collective benefit and community-centered and driven work. And this I think impacts us um, quite a bit as we think about as individual researchers, as research um, you know, programs and units, and as a department, when we think about our orientation to Indigenous research, thinking about that collective benefit, um, and also making sure that it's community-centered and driven research, and it's not something that is sort of tacked on to a broader research question. As, a, as the, um, in my role at ICES, I, you know, especially early on was seeing a lot of, I did this really wonderful analysis and paper um, about whatever, list whatever, injury rates, um, uh, perinatal outcomes, like anything you can think of. And I would just really like to do it just specifically also for First Nations, because I think it would be helpful for them. That approach is not community centered and it's not community driven. So um, it's reorienting ourselves to think about what are the questions that community um, uh, organizations, um, that community members, that, that community leaders have that will help them to make decisions, um, that will help them to um, find the next step on their journeys to health, well-being um, from their perspectives. 
thinking about um, health from their perspective. And then these are often cited, um, you know, for ours <laughs> approaches, which is to think about always respect, reciprocity, so that giving and taking, and the responsibility and the relevance. And the way that this like reciprocity comes through can be in so many ways, but it's really in this relationship where you know you're when when um, even to the to the point of sharing a little bit about oneself and building those relationships in a way that's sustainable and meaningful. I also wanted to talk about this concept that they, they really, there's so many concepts in the two row um, wampum and the two row treaty. And sometimes, you know, often we're thinking about these kinds of approaches, two row approaches, when we're thinking about how to integrate and honor Indigenous perspectives in the work that we're doing at universities. And so um, the reason that we think about that is because the meaning of this, um, these two rows is that one, one of these rows, you know, is, is in, in is um, Indigenous peoples in, they were Haudenosaunee people who set this treaty and they're traveling in their vessel with their languages, with um, identities, worldviews, governance structures and family structures, traveling along, alongside a vessel in the same river that is um, made up of settler um, governance structure, language, knowledge systems, and that these two societies can travel along the same river in peace and friendship without interfering with one another. So they can travel alongside each other without interfering. And this principle of non-interference is so critical. It really impacts, um, you know, the way clinically, the way program development would work, the way research works, that we are um, always thinking about how to work together and alongside each other without interfering with the knowledge systems, the language structures, the governance structures of Indigenous people or of settler society. So th that's the meaning, some of the meaning of this treaty. There's a lot that is in here. So it also implies Indigenous sovereignty. It also implies that this non-interference means that, that, that that's so those sovereign nations um, have to be able to live with so in self-determination. But we know what happened. Like we know that what, what was promised and the relationship that existed and we know what happened. So we know that that kind of circle of governance and family, all the things that were in that one vessel have been very disrupted and impacted by the processes of assimilation and colonization. And so, you know, through legislation like the Indian Act, through land appropriation and the numbered treaties that came um, with the spirit of economic development and assimilation and residential schools that these have really disrupted um, this, this um, self-determining identity of Indigenous nations. So we have to, so this is that second point that I made that we, we were going to talk about, that we really need to have a shared understanding of that colonization. We, and I think that's increasing in our society, we better understand it, but in our department and in our research programs and in each of our lives, we have to think about what it means for how we do our work and how we relate to the original peoples of this land. So, um, and I, you know, it's colonization, but the, the, each of these um, streams, these vehicles of colonization, these, this legislation, land appropriation treaties and residential schools had the express purpose of assimilation. And, um, you know, for example, when speaking about the Indian Act, um, the great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and assimilate the Indian people in all respects with the other inhabitants of the dominion as speedily as they are fit to change. And about residential schools, in order to educate the children properly, we must separate them from their families. Some people may say that this is hard, but if we want to civilize them, we must do that. So what we end up with is a fragmentation 
Um, but still this underlying strength of this, these governance structures of this knowledge system and of this self-determination. But through processes of intergenerational effects of residential schools and the, in the, so this quote here from someone whose parents attended residential schools says it visited us every day of our childhood through the replaying over and over of our parents' childhood trauma and grief which they never had the opportunity to resolve in their lifetimes. And you can see, like, I don't know where all of you are from or where you have spent time, but you can see um, really from this map of re where residential schools, um, where residential schools in Canada were. These are just the residential schools, not even all the day schools. Um, but the concentration here in the West and really that parallels these numbered treaties that were going across the West to try and get people to make way for the railroad to get people out of the way. So this processes of residential schools and treaties work together um, to to um, to try and disrupt um, that circle and, and what was in that one vessel of, uh, of Indigenous knowledges. So understanding that, you know, governments, universities, all, all of these things that are part of our colonial um, structures in Canada have been part of this trauma and have been part of this disruption. So we have this shared responsibility of working toward reconciliation. And again, just like, I think that when we're thinking about um, acknowledging the truth of what those things did, but also each individual person, every one of us thinking about our own role in reconciliation and that shared responsibility. How do we teach our classes? How do we, you know, if we're a TA, how do we TA? What are our approaches? Um, it, it, you know, in, in whatever sphere that we're working and in particular in research um, because of the damage that research um, has done and the importance of thinking about it differently with Indigenous populations. And if we think about what it is we need to think about differently, it's really grounded in those different ways of knowing, doing, and being, and also the reason we need to really, other than, you know, our shared commitment to reconciliation, is that these are Indigenous people's rights. It's not up for discussion. It is rights. It's not something nice to do off the side of, of whatever we're doing. It's a recognition that Indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination and that the Indigenous peoples here have a right to self-determination. Um, and actually there's several, um, uh, several articles in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that are really helpful. I have a list of articles. I mean, they're all towards self-determination, but ones that are specifically, um, you know, relevant to research and, and um, I can share that. And then also it's sort of enshrined in our own thinking with the Tri-Council Policy Statement, Chapter 9, uh, which focuses on research involving First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples of Canada. So probably everyone has been exposed to this at some point. And that really, this is where I want to move into our conversation a little bit, is that, that when we're thinking about research, it has, Indigenous research has to respect both the role of the community in shaping the conduct of the research and the autonomy of individuals to decide whether they will participate in research. So whereas you know, our ethics processes, our research ethics processes generally focus on individual consent, if you can see that there, what we're also talking about is collective consent, that there's a role of the community in shaping the conduct of research. So there has to be a collective consent in addition to individual consent when we're thinking about Indigenous research approaches. And that's sometimes very tricky because it's not a checkbox. We can't say, oh, you always need a band council resolution. And that's collective consent. Sometimes that's appropriate. And sometimes that's not the appropriate collective consent. So we have to really be thinking about in the context of this research, and the people that we're working with and the questions that we're asking, 
what is the appropriate collective consent for this research project? And it's really, the reason for this is partly, um, partly this, that we, if we have indigenous governance of indigenous data and research, then we also need to build in the indigenous, the use of that indigenous data and research for governance. So this governance cycle, it's like um, indigenous nations need to govern the research, but they also need to use that in information and data and research for governance. So that it's a cycle that builds nations. So it's not just about, um, it's not just the, 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 the idea of doing research it has to involve action and has to involve something that is beneficial collectively and that can be used for making change. First Nations in Canada for years have asserted um, governance over First Nations data in the form of the, these OCAP principles. So if, if you've heard before about OCAP principles, it refer to the rights of First Nations communities to own, protect and control how their information is used for research and other purposes. So it says that if there's First Nations data, so if you are in a lab that has any data that has a First Nations identifier on it, then this, these principles apply. Ownership, of the data should be with First Nations. Control of the data should be with First Nations. Access to the data should be with First Nations and possession of the data should be with First Nations. That's, the possession is always the hardest one. Um, and I would say that we have lots of experiences now where um, the possession, you know, because you're always navigating both, you know, provincial um, privacy legislation, the PHIPA and, and things, you know, there's lots to navigate. Um, but sometimes the possession is, becomes more of a virtual possession because of um, data governance agreements or other things that you put in place. So one example is this framework that we use at ICES, where we hold all that um, administrative health data, and where we balance ethical relationships, like ongoing everyday ethical relationships and mutual capacity building with data governance. Um, and formalize data governance agreements. So you can't really do this work without having um, really good relationships and writing them down. <laughs> so those two things have to come together. Um, and that's, this is like for, you know, large data centers, but it applies to um, projects as well. Having um, formalized um, research agreements um, also is an approach that helps to solidify the Indigenous research methodologies that you're taking. And often they outline OCAP and how you're going to respect OCAP, for example. Um, that we have this action component always that we're, um, that it's about evidence to build policies and programs. And it's about indigenous nations having that information and that we're um, honoring indigenous perspectives and models of well-being. that we're really thinking about that methodology when we're, when we're doing this work. One other set of principles that I'll draw your attention to that's a little bit broader, but also a little bit more specific <laughs> is that um, these principles, so you may have heard of FAIR principles. They're often talked about in research that research data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So the research, global research communities are talking about FAIR principles. And so um, groups of Indigenous researchers have come together to say, but if, you're, if the data are also, the research data is also Indigenous data, then we need to also implement these CARE principles. And um, I, I'm happy to share these slides and the, the citations are there where you can learn more about these principles. And I say they're broader because they're not First Nations specific, but they're also, but they would direct you to, to OCAP. Like, you know, the immediate thing would be understanding the perspectives of the people that you're working with. So they would direct you to OCAP, but they're also more specific because they're about data, really about data that have been collected about Indigenous nations and what to do with this data that have been collected through the process of research that end up telling the story of Indigenous nations. So just to summarize that, you know, we have to make these spaces for Indigenous research methodologies and the conversations that, um, that have to happen 
to understand diverse indigenous perspectives and in governments. We have to make space for diverse indigenous perspectives and in governance. We can't just say there has, there's always a band council resolution. There's always a research agreement and here's the template. There's, there's some of that can happen, but it's not one size fits all that part of Indigenous research methodologies is the building of relationships and is the uniqueness of the, of the relationships and the process for each community. Um, and we also have to make sure that our processes are not interfering with existing Indigenous governance and relationships, which is actually quite complex sometimes. Um, and then we also have to have strong established uh, relationships that are ongoing and that we have an, a ongoing commitment to building our capacity as uh, at universities and institutions, research institutions, but also um, building capacity in communities um, to, to better, um, you know, support research that they want to do. Um, and we really just need to build in those processes to support community-led questions, community-led analysis, and community-led interpret interpretation. So I'm going to pause for a second to uh, allow space for my colleague, um, Bernice. Are you still there? <laughs> Hi, Jen. Yes, I am. Oh, good. Okay, I'll stop sharing so you can share. Okay, perfect. It's always great to hear about your work and uh, the emerging work internationally with our colleagues. Um, okay, so I'll share my screen here. <clears throat> okay, so thank you also, um, Lisa, for, for your introduction. I just wanted to make one clarification that I've never worked for Health Canada, um, but I uh, have worked closely with them. <laughs> And uh, so I want to say uh, more formally, Buju, um, Bernice Downey, Nigana Kwe, Dijishnikas, Bajig Anang, Nidijnikas, Lake St. Martin, Nadunjaba, Ontario, Dinda, Anishinaabe Kwe, Endo. Greetings. My name is Bernice Downey. I've also been given a name of head woman. I'm an Ojibwe Soto woman. My family ties are with Lake St. Martin, First Nations in the Treaty 2 area of Manitoba. Um, I also have Celtic ancestry, which I'm very proud of, but know less about. I'm presently living and working on the traditional territory of the Chippewa, Odawa, Potawatomi, Delaware, and Oneida Nations near London. I'm a medical anthropologist and assistant professor in the School of Nursing and the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences. And as mentioned, I'm the inaugural Dean, Associate Dean Indigenous Health in the Faculty of Health Sciences. I've been the strategic lead for the development of um, the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge. Gijigeu Oma Gawa Bundiung. It is great that we see each other here today. Okay, so um, <clears throat> as you can see there, uh, I have a couple of translations of the title of our, our um, institute. Um, the Anishinaabe translation there means the good life or medicine recovery healing lodge. The Mohawk translation for the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge uh, translates to the place of good life and return to health. It's not so much important that you're able to say um, the Indigenous Health Learning Lodge in our, our languages that uh, of the people that we work with, but just to know um, that uh, you know, the use of our in Indigenous languages is important to us. And that translating the lodge in both a Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe language represents an important aspect of the work ahead to implement our Indigenous health sciences education strategic priorities. Our Knowledge Helpers Advisory Council gave much time and thought to ensuring these translations accurately reflected the essence of this work. Our indigenous languages are a direct connection to our culture that was created um, as the container of and only true way to express indigenous epistemologies. And in this international decade of indigenous languages, indigenous peoples the world over 
have contributed to the discourse regarding the importance of indigenous language preservation and utilization and have called for its integration into all aspects of our society, political domains and strategic agendas. An important connection between indigenous language promotion and revitalization and the work of our indigenous health learning lodge is the acknowledgement of our indigenous traditional knowledge systems. Um, as outlined um, very carefully by my colleague. Our ancestral and traditional knowledge along with complementary medicine that is handed on through Indigenous languages must be recognized among policy decision makers and researchers in the health sciences education realm. And so, <clears throat> Our path to the establishment of our learning lodge um, this year was the culmination of a five year development phase, which began with my appointment as the indigenous health lead for the faculty of health science. The goal was to develop a strategic response to the truth and reconciliation commission of Canada's calls to action. More specifically, the call out to faculties of health sciences to educate and train non-indigenous health care practitioners and to foster the increase of the number of Indigenous healthcare practitioners. This year, the launch of our Indigenous Health Learning Lodge signals an important structural enhancement with an entity within the faculty that espouses an Indigenous academic community of staff, faculty, students, and knowledge helpers. The Learning Lodge will help build momentum in this work with the implementation of our Indigenous Health Education Strategic Plan and establishing an Indigenous structural presence. Both are required in supporting the systemic change process and structural reform needed to close the gaps in health outcomes, educate non-Indigenous healthcare professionals and researchers, and address barriers for Indigenous learners and scholars in the Faculty of Health Science. And so I apologize, this. It's pretty small um, to read uh, carefully, uh, but this just represents the structure and how at the top you have our, our faculty kind of horizontal, you know, um, aligns with that Western approach to leadership and hierarchy. Um, but you see filtered in here, you know, how we've tried to harmonize some of the systems that we'll be using. So you have here the executive director of our learning lodge who reports to myself, but, but I also have a collective and accountable, a collective accountable link to both our Indigenous Education Council here at McMaster University, our McMaster Indigenous Research Institute, and our Indigenous Health Education Advisory Council for, uh, for the faculty. So then this represents various external partners um, and hubs that we are exploring. So here we see the, uh, the focus more internally uh, for the lodge. And I won't go through all of these, um, but you can see here by having an, a, an elders and traditional practitioners hub, uh, we hope to advance uh, the work related to uh, what I just talked about. And that is, you know, revitalization of the language, understanding how to harmonize uh, traditional approaches to wellness uh, with Western approaches, um, of course, we have our longstanding Indigenous Student Services and Support Program, formerly known as ISHIS. And then you see over here on the bottom left, um, our Research Collaboration Hub. And so, uh, which we, we call our Research Hub and expect likely to have another uh, Indigenous translation of the, uh, of the hub. And so we're in early days, um, you know, we expect the work ahead. Uh, to further envision the implementation of these objectives that you see before you, and that um, it will be done collaboratively with both our Indigenous and non-Indigenous collaborators. It's expected that we will work closely with the McMaster Indigenous Re Research Institute, or MIRI, as we call it. And as mentioned um, by Dr. Iorio, that um, the recruitment of Dr. Jennifer Walker, my colleague, and her joint appointment to HEI and the Learning Lodge further increases our capacity to move forward in this area. Jen will lead the further development of, of the hub, and we have already embarked on planning for articulating our mandate, our operational team needs, and our visioning process. 
So here we have the skeleton outline of the four thematic objectives that were identified in our strategic plan. And, uh, you know, we will be further uh, defining um, priorities and activities um, related to that. However, in our early discussions, our preliminary work in collaboration with Miri and others on the Indigenous team, uh, we were talking about these preliminary priority areas. And so an initial assessment includes a uh, focus on knowledge exchange, of course, uh, both in the realm of advocacy, relationship building uh, with community partners um, and other Indigenous entities, um, special lectures, podcasts, um, presentations such as these. So we feel that this, this uh, knowledge exchange element uh, is critically important. Research participation, of course, is important as well. And I think um, the important point to be made here that, you know, as soon as an Indigenous faculty is recruited, all of a sudden they get a thousand requests to participate in various research projects. And, and we, we just can't respond to that. We don't, we don't have the capacity. Um, but, you know, collaborating in a, in a more advisory capacity um, referrals, uh, expert advisement versus in-depth collaboration and leadership of research uh, is indicated. Um, community collaboration, for example, uh, referral to potential research partners to advance their community research priorities. Uh, academic collaboration could be what we're doing, what we're embarking now um, on participation of the Global Nexus Initiative and the CFREF um, application. Um, system change examples include collaboration and ethics reform with HIRIB, promotion of Indigenous ways of knowing, capacity building uh, via training for research assistants and coordinators. We need, to, we need to build our infrastructure so that we can respond uh, more effectively. And so as this work unfolds, an important implementation factor will be the reflexive and active support of our institutional and individual allies. And I use that distinction because I often find that uh, individuals, um, faculty, uh, staff, they, they want to know what they can do to support our work. They often are unaware and ask for um, help in that regard, or they're fearful to take a lead um, or to use their role um, without um, permission, if you will. And what I tell people is that, you know, you can also be an institutional ally, and that is using your expertise in whatever role you have, um, it might be it leadership or research or education, um, to work alongside Indigenous peoples and bring that, you know, in, in, the, in the words of um, uh, the uh, lead commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, Murray Sinclair, he said, you know, this is not going to be done by Indigenous peoples alone. We need our experts, we need our non-Indigenous helpers walking alongside us. And so the champions are folks like Dr. Alfonso Iorio, informed and, and committed to advancing Indigenous research and to signaling and integrating important reform elements into the policy and culture of individual departmental and program networks. And so, um, you know, I have to say there've been many, many champions and supporters and allies along the way, too numerous to mention. Um, we are taking an approach of honoring folks as we go. And so watch for that in our upcoming newsletter. And uh, we look forward to collaborating, um, you know, hopefully with some of you folks that are on the call today. And um, our, our website is still under construction. There's still good information that you can find there. Um, but we are um, in the process of uh, revamping it. So I'll pause there and turn it back over to yourself, Jen. Thanks, Bernice. And maybe we should also mention that we have a physical location for the large... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's kind of basic knowledge. We're in the uh, MDCL room 3510. We, we don't only exist on Zoom. <laughs> we finally have... Um, very lovely new offices and um, so yeah if you're in in the neighborhood in MDCL please stop by. Well thank you um, really those were the messages we wanted to convey I think we still have time for some discussion and questions um, 
Lisa is uh, encouraging people to use the chat box for questions and comments. Um, but just thank you so much, Nyawe Miigwech, for having us and for um, yeah, giving us this opportunity to introduce ourselves. Oh, um, okay. Lisa cannot unmute. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. I still can't turn on my camera though, so. Um, uh, so first, thank you so much for an excellent talk, um, both Jennifer and Bernice. I think you've raised our awareness and expanded our, our thinking already. Um, but I will open up the chat here for comments and questions. Um, and if, if it's okay to take the moment while people are gathering their own ideas to ask some questions of my own, or at least one question, I'll, I'll, I'll take the moment if that's okay. Um, because I'm really struck about what you've both said about um, research methodologies and uh, really the underpinning theory that, um, you know, that informs our methods and the work that we do on a regular basis that we just don't think about. Um, and guess I was wondering two things. I mean, one, particularly Jennifer in, in epidemiology, have has it been difficult to reconcile the approaches that you learn academically, I guess, institutionally, with the practices that you you know that, that you're describing that you want to um, espouse, and then also for those of us who are looking to practice our own allyship you know, what should we be thinking about in terms of the methodologies and, the, and these theoretical considerations um, that we could change that would help the most? Big questions. Thank you so much for those questions. So I'll say that, um, you know, the, when, when I was a PhD student, when I was a graduate student at the University of Calgary, I, I want, like I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to learn things from both perspectives. That opportunity wasn't there for me in the department where I was at that time. Um, people would say, well, if you want to, so people who are doing indigenous health research would say, if you, and none of these people were indigenous, but if, if you want to do, if you want to do things that are meaningful, you can't do epidemiology. You can't, Indigenous people don't like to count. You can't do epidemiology and make it meaningful for Indigenous people. So they were all doing qualitative research. And then I, but I wanted to learn epidemiology. <laughs> and the people who were supervising epidemiology were saying, um, yeah, no, that, that doesn't, like, we don't know how to do that with Indigenous populations. That doesn't, doesn't apply in the same way. It was, it, it is a very hard thing to reconcile. Um, and, uh, but I'm just so grateful now that I can, um, I can work with students who are Indigenous, who, um, are thinking in multiple ways, <laughs> um, and we can, we can acknowledge that you can use the methods and tools of Western science, like that epidemiology, the methods and tools of it, um, are available to us, we have to just be working in ways that are incorporating Indigenous methodologies um, in our approaches, in our perspectives, and in honoring Indigenous knowledges. Um, so I think that, so I really see like a lot of the methods that I learned as tools in a toolbox really, um, but and have to acknowledge that the underpinnings are sometimes very positivist um, that sometimes don't reconcile well with the perspectives of Indigenous partners. The other thing I've also learned is how to work very closely with, um, with qualitative researchers and those who think about things um, from different perspectives and anyone who's tried to do mixed methods work recognizes how challenging it is to be coming from different theoretical groundings and perspectives, but um, it really is, um, it, it is a rich way to work, I think. Um, I don't know, Bernice, you took yourself off mute. Do you have some comments and thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. It's a, a great question, Lisa. You know, I think in, in terms of the allyship piece, so um, I think that, you know, attitude 
um, is huge for, for uh, an ally. Um, you know, apart from trying to find your way through indigenous research methodologies and understand it. Um, but there's also this um, challenging area of working with non-indigenous partners uh, who, you know, have a lack of trust, or do not know what indigenous research is all about, or have a mistrust of indigenous knowledge or healing ways or indigenous science, and they have trouble accepting that this exists. And, and you know, in a, in a faculty that strongly weights an evidence-based approach, uh, but we have to ask ourselves, whose evidence are we using and how did we get it? And um, an example, <laughs> an example uh, that I can share with you is that I participated with another colleague of mine on a panel for a medical, uh, medical uh, cannabis, uh, with the use of medical cannabis with children uh, dialogue. And um, so when it got to be our turn to speak, and you know, we talked about these various um, aspects of our work, uh, similar to what Jen did today, um, and then started to think about some of the scenarios that were being discussed. You know, there was a kind of a quiet response, which I'm very familiar with, because people often don't know the questions to ask, or they're reluctant to ask for fear of offending us. But then all of a sudden, you know, the bomb dropped. And, and it was a speaker who said, um, well, that's basically, you know, that's all really nice to know. But when we're talking about my children, and I want, I want quality evidence. And so the next day, um, I came in late the next day, um, for my second part of the panel, but my colleague informed me that the addition of the term quality evidence was subtly included in almost every comment um, that was made. And so, you know, for me, it was, you know, kind of um, encapsulated the attitude that happens and that, you know, Indigenous knowledge, traditional healing, Indigenous research methodologies that you know, they don't fit in the realm of um, evidence-based approaches. And so, you know, co-creating space, even if you don't understand it, to, you know, engage in that two-row approach of respect and, um, you know, working alongside us as we work through this together. And um, again, uh, for Murray Sinclair, this is the tall mountain to climb um, to gain recognition and respect uh, for our Indigenous ways of knowing. And so I would say um, that's, that's the key, um, you know, educating yourself, it's an ongoing basis, cultural safety training, um, you know, reaching out, utilizing some of the very good resources that are emerging out there that, that uh, Jen's um, um, showed on one of her slides. Thank you. These are excellent responses. And I guess I hear you talking about this need to decentralize the, the, the assumed privilege of, um, of, of, of our own approaches. And, and I think as you ask that question, you know, not just what evidence, but how did we get it? Um, and the troubling ways in which much of that evidence was, was, was got. Um, Samir, um, hi, oh, sorry. I, well, we I have just... another question. Yeah, I was just Go going to um, respond, take a quick stab at Samir's um, question there. Yep. Um, Great. <laughs> you know, the collaboration with international Indigenous colleagues has been a real boon for our work here in Canada. And that collaboration is over 20 years old for Indigenous health uh, researchers. You know, we established an international network of Indigenous health researchers, which was great benefit for us in influencing um, uh, health research uh, funding agencies and government uh, stakeholders uh, with, with our priorities and our objectives. And, and those were in early days uh, when, you know, the OCAP movement was just emerging um, that Jen referred to. Um, but I find that any international collaboration um, is very effective uh, for member states then to be able to influence uh, government-wide or national um, level processes. And I'll turn it over to you, Jen, you probably want to talk about the data sovereignty network. Yeah, so on both fronts, sort of there's, um, I mentioned that um, the care principles were developed through a network called the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, GIDA, 
Um, so we have strong collaborations there. And then on the dementia um, research side, that so we've developed, we, I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but we've developed a, a Canadian Indigenous cognitive assessment um, that's being used now um, in, in Anishinaabe communities. And um, that came from learning in the Kimberley region, Indigenous um, communities in the Kimberley region in Australia. So we've had tons of collaboration with Australia um, and New Zealand in terms of dementia research, Indigenous dementia research. I think that it's safe to say that there's a lot of global collaboration. <laughs> That's a great question. Thanks, Samir. Um, are there further questions? And, and would it be fair to say, just to follow on, that Canada has really produced outstanding guidance? Um, I, I think probably I've seen some from Australia as well, but a lot of people refer, even in the global context, to OCAP, for example, um, and, and find Chapter 9 of TCPS or, or the, the document that preceded it um, to be useful. So is it fair to say that we're, we're, we're doing better than most? Mm, maybe that's not a nice way to put I think it. Maybe in the nineties we were doing. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Since came out, we were doing great. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, we've been, yeah we we were leaders in it for a long time. Um, yeah, I think others have caught up and maybe surpassed. But Bernice, what's your perspective on that? Well, yeah. I mean, I I kind of one of those people that have had two careers in my life, and um, I have to say, you know at McMaster now seeing our infrastructure go from, you know, one indigenous faculty to now I think we're like over 20. Um, we, you know, we're not too many on the health science side. We need like 10 to 15 more to increase our capacity and to really, you know, engage in depth in this work. But, you know, to see, to have an, a McMaster Indigenous Research Institute uh, to see many, you know, of the of our faculties, uh, you know, beginning to carefully step back and try to understand what they need to do within their faculties and their departments and their programs, um, you know, to see what's happening in our own faculty is, you know, very encouraging. It's not to say we don't have a long way to go yet, um, but you know, after a 35-year career in in health and Indigenous health and research, it's uh, you know, it's comforting to know that we're moving. Um, in the right direction, I guess. Um, so I think McMaster, you know, is, you know, it, it, especially in our Faculty of Health Science has, has been really innovative. And with the launch of our Learning Lodge and the development of our research hub, you know, there'll be more uh, good work to come. Excellent. I'm not seeing any further questions and I know we were meant to stop at two o'clock. Um, unless there's something else that pops up in the chat, we would go over just a tiny bit, but this, if it, this is time for a break. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank you both. These, this, these were very powerful presentations. And I think many of us will be looking forward to, um, to, to learning more, um, to maybe participating in the Learning Lodge and some of the other activities that are, that are being planned. Um, and want to say it was, it's long in coming. It's about time. Um, that we have seen this kind of presence um, on campus and in our faculty. So um, we're very grateful you took the time to share this with us. We look forward to further and um, thank you very much. Miigwech. Thanks everyone. Thank you.